Welcome back. It is a pleasure to have your presence in this closing webinar entitled Tips and Tricks to Shorten the Distance During Online Teaching. Before we begin with this activity, we want to explain the dynamics of this webinar. We appreciate you keep your mics and cameras off at all times to avoid interruptions during the webinar. With the purpose of maximizing the time for every session, we invite you to ask your questions in the chat of this Zoom session. These questions will be written down by our, by our organizing committee, and we will share them with the specialists following their posting order in the chat. We advise you to verify that when posting your questions, you are sharing them with the whole group of the session. If any question cannot be answered, in this session, the organizing committee will send it to the specialist and he will send the answers by email to the participants of this seminar. Jonathan Elizondo is an experienced Costa Rican EFL professional who devotes his time and energy seeking ways to enhance his students' learning processes. He is especially interested in exploring the impact of technology in the English classroom and specifically in using technologies to improve students' language skills. Currently, this is the topic of his dissertation to obtain a PhD in education from Universidad Internacional Iberoamericana in Mexico, UNINI. Mr. Elizondo holds an MA in teaching English as a foreign language and a BA in primary education with emphasis in English teaching, both degrees from the University of Costa Rica. He also holds a licentiate, a bachelor's degree in English teaching from Universidad Americana. Jonathan is a certified digital teacher from the Seed Graduate Institute of Vermont and has experience teaching English to different age groups. At present, he works for the Ministry of Public Education at Centro de Capacitación Educación a Distancia, CESET, en Universidad Estatal a Distancia, and as an international speaking examiner for Cambridge Assessment English. He has also worked as a facilitator for Instituto Cultural Dominicano Americano in the Dominican Republic. Without further delays, let us welcome Master Jonathan Elizondo. Hello, um, thank you very much, Tobias, for that great presentation, and I want to um, thank the organizing committee for this uh, honor, because I'm, I'm actually really honored to be here um, in, in this seminar. I know, uh, and I want to thank everybody, 41 people who are actually here in this presentation today. I want to thank you because I know we started yesterday, you have been here the whole day today, and you're still here. So, I have, it's an honor for me to close this seminar, but also a challenge because I know by this time, you're probably a little tired, okay? So um, let me tell you a little bit about today's presentation. So it's tips and tricks to shorten the distance during online teaching. And the reason why I decided to do this, it's because since last year that we went sent home, um, we were sent home, um, people started wondering a lot about what should I do? How should I cope with all of this uh, COVID thing and working from home and teaching at a distance? Uh, many questions. And so uh, I decided to use a little bit of my experience as a professor at UNED um, because we were actually used to working at a distance. But then I also started thinking about uh, what kind of distance do we need to have and what kind of distance do we, do we want to avoid? Um, so basically my idea today is to show you that yes, there is a physical distance, but we don't want to have that emotional distance, okay? Or that disconnection with our students. And that's uh, basically what we're going to try to do today. Um, so first of all, I would like to start with a warm up. And for this session, just for you to know, we're going to be using different tools as well. So if you have your smartphones there, just have them ready because you might be uh, reading some QR codes later in the session. And also the chat, which I have open here in my, um, in my screen. And if at any point you have a question, you can type it in the chat. 
If it is related to what I am talking at that particular moment, I will probably address the question right away. Otherwise, the organizing committee will take notes and they will ask the questions. At the end, we're going to have a Q&A session, okay? So what is something you are grateful for this week? I want you to think about that. What is something you are grateful for this week? And I want you to type it in the chat. I can tell you that I am grateful because I've been uh, doing so many things this week. It, it was actually uh, one of the most productive weeks I think I, I've had. Um, and, and today has been really a, a real, really wonderful day. Um, so I see here uh, people saying that they are uh, grateful for health, uh, my dad's health. I have a job, uh, feeling safe at home. Um, yes, I'm alive. Uh, my vaccine against COVID, great, okay? Uh, so, so many things that we have to be grateful for. And this past year and a half hasn't been, um, hasn't been an easy one, but there are so many things we can be grateful for, right? Unfortunately, things with rain here in Costa Rica hasn't been um, really good for everybody. Some of us are really um, safe at home. Some other people are suffering and struggling. So um, we, we have really so many things to be grateful for. Thank you for sharing, to be alive in my family for this webinar, my family, my job, my pets, to be alive. Yes, great. Okay, so after those ideas, let's see the objectives that we have for today's session. So in today's session, we're going to be defining different concepts related to online teaching. And I basically want to pay attention to one particular concept that I'm going to show you in a couple of minutes. We're going to outline the importance of building presence and report during distance, uh, the distance learning process. Uh, because I think for me particularly, that is key. It doesn't matter how much you, um, you plan. It doesn't matter how many tools you have. If you don't build that rapport with your students, and, and I mean, that is always the same also in face-to-face -face interactions in the classroom, but in online teaching, I think we need to work stronger. And um, yesterday I was looking at some of the, in the video they showed us, there was a picture of Rita Pearson and in her TED talk, she, she says a phrase that I always remember, students don't learn from people they don't like. So we're going to look at the importance of building presence and rapport. We're going to differentiate between synchronous and asynchronous um, and blended instruction, okay? So when do we talk about one? When do we talk about the other one? Or when, it, when is it blended? And how we can deal with those different types of instruction. And finally, we're going to experience some tools that enhance the learning process, okay? So having these objectives in mind, this is the um, agenda for the day. We're going to start with a getting to know you. I always like to uh, get to know you a little bit more. And number two, building presence and report. We're going to uh, talk about making decisions or key decisions in the classroom and tools to facilitate the process. And finally, the Q&A session, okay? So for the next uh, three hours and a half, no, I'm just kidding, for the next hour, Hopefully we're going to be uh, devoting uh, or, or exploring all of these topics, okay? So let's begin by uh, doing some menti. I want you to share with me some of your ideas. Here you have a QR code. If you have a phone, you can just scan the QR code and it will take you directly to the menti. Or you can go online and type www.menti.com uh, and the code is 47 three two zero seven five zero. In a moment, I'm going to share the, the Menti. If you haven't been able to get there, on top of the Menti, you're going to see the also the, the um, website, menti.com and the code, okay? So I want you to go there. I want you to uh, feel free. This tool is one tool that I really like because it's totally anonymous. People don't have to worry about me knowing who they are but, uh, by name, but I really want to know the whole audience a little bit more. And I encourage you to use it with your students as well. They are going to like it a lot. So in the chat, you already have the, um, the website, menti.com. And remember the code 47320750. So here is the uh, menti. And I'm going to start right away with some of the questions. So 
So the first question is what population do you or would you teach in the future or do you currently teach? I know many people are probably from elementary school, but I know as well that we have some teachers here from high school and university. Um, I'm not sure about preschool, but I just want to know how many people uh, do I have in this audience and, and where you're working or will you be working in the future? Uh, so thank you very much. Great participation. I really like that because even though we are uh, not in the same place, we get to interact somehow, right? Um, so remember, if you haven't been able to enter, menti.com and the code 47320750. So I see that most people here work or will work at elementary schools. And some of you um, in high school, seven people, uh, eight people, actually, that's a good number, 11 uh, teachers at university, okay? Um, all right. So let's see our next uh, question. Had you taught or learned online before 2020? Before 2020, think about 2019 and before. Had you taught or had you ever learned online before that particular year? Because even though I see many people saying, yes, you see there are still people who by 2020 hadn't had that experience. And so that is important to know at this point. We have 19, uh, 20, and seven people say no. Okay, very good. Mm -hmm. The next question that I have for you, um, what do you like best about teaching or learning online? And I think here what you have to do is to type a word or a phrase. And I want you to share with me, what do you like best about teaching or learning online. And the reason why I have teaching and learning is because I know we have teachers, but we also have students here. Um, and so it's important to think about both settings, or maybe you're a teacher and you're also studying and you wanna think about your learning experience more than your teaching experience. So I see here sharing, being creative, flexibility, variety, apps, collaboration, activities you can do, um, Mm -hmm. Let's see, challenge, convenience, all right, new experience, tools. And now by looking at this um, uh, word cloud, we can see that the words you are repeating the most are the bigger ones. So we have flexibility, um, convenience, technological tools and apps. Those are the ones you have been repeating a little bit more during this answer, okay? Flexibility, I like that one a lot. Um, I mean, flexibility, it's something that I really like. And, and I like not only flexibility in terms of teaching, but also in terms of uh, having more time at home, being with the family, with my pets, um, having more time to do things that I really enjoy because I usually have two jobs that I have to um, work uh, at many different times, and then I have a little bit more time to do some reading, for example, okay, or Netflix. Okay, um, what do you find most difficult? We talked about the good. Now let's talk about the difficult, about teaching or learning at a distance. What is it that you say, hmm, I think this is something quite difficult to me. Again, you're going to be asked to type your ideas and then you click submit and we're going to see your ideas here, okay? So look, lack of social interaction, okay? Misunderstanding, having students interact, keep students uh, focused, keep students attention, to use different technological tools, the connectivity, real interaction, uh, keeping attention, organizing my own time, uh huh. That organizing your own time, uh, this is something we teachers and also students struggle with uh, regarding distance education, and it has to do a lot of, with self-regulation and autonomy, but that can be a topic for a later uh, workshop. Um, short period to learn, uh, of, to learn the tools to be used. That's right. Uh, we were sent home in March, and then a, a couple of weeks later, we were teaching at a distance and we didn't have time to cope with everything that was going on. Thank you very much for your valuable answers. 
Now, from one to five um, today, how comfortable do you feel using the following? Not comfortable at all will be one, and very comfortable with, will be a five. How comfortable do you feel using Zooms, uh, Zoom, Teams, and Meet? So video conferencing, basically. How comfortable are you using collaborative documents, Google Drive, for example, uh, or OneDrive, or Dropbox? Quizzes, Kahoot, and Bamboozle. So um, that is gamification. And Mentimeter, Poll Everywhere, or Direct Poll, which is basically to have, uh, what is it, real-time interaction, okay, with your students or with your audience. So I see that um, as I was kind of expecting, many people say you are very comfortable uh, using video conferencing tools. Of course, I cannot tell you how many video conferences I've had since uh, March last year. I think at least one a day, at least, because sometimes it's more than one. Um, collaborative documents, uh, then quizzes, Kahoot, Bamboozle, Mentimeter, Poll Everywhere, Direct Poll. You know what is interesting about this particular question? This is not the first time I, I delivered this presentation. And every single time I delivered it in uh, Peru, I delivered it um, in, in uh, Costa Rica a couple of months ago. I delivered it with teachers at MEP and the answers are almost the same. It, feel, it feels like very interesting to see that even though we are separate because of physical distance, we are so connected in these kind of uh, topics, right? Okay, um, thinking about your last lesson taught or attended, um, what would be a change you wanna make? I mean, we teachers tend to be very self-critical and we tend to say, hmm, after I finish this class, this is something that I didn't like. So what is that that you would like to change? Or as a student, as an attendee to the um, workshop or to a session um, or to a class, what would you like to change? Let's see, mm, more dynamic, solidarity, more dynamic to have more interactive exercises. Mm -hmm. Solidarity, more speaking, all right. More technological tools, using more activities and creative app. Students to speak more, more interactive with, uh, more interaction with students, that people know the etiquette to participate online. You're right. Mm -hmm. More interaction among students, input from students, okay. That students speak more, student participation, solidarity, classroom time is not enough. I think it is never enough, not even face-to-face -face, uh, presence, right? Okay. And what is one successful activity you had in your last online class? So as you notice, I don't really want to focus only on the negative or only on the positive. I want to look at both sides of the coin. I want to see the good, the bad, and the ugly. And those of you who are younger than I am probably uh, don't know the movie, but um, let's see, what is one successful activity? So maybe you can say, I really liked, uh, for example, the Zoom session, clock times quest, oral presentations, the fact that learning was achieved, Jeopardy as a game, the implementation of my first lesson plan, amazing, congratulations on that first lesson plan. That always feels really exciting, I know. I just remember my first time uh, in front of a classroom. Previous speaking, oral presentations to play with students. All right, great. A lot of good things, you see, a lot of successful activities in your classes, right? Okay, so we're going to go back to the presentation. And um, now let's continue um, talking a little bit about these questions we might have as teachers. So when we are teaching at a distance or teaching online, I might be wondering, what am I actually doing? Uh, am I just talking to a computer here, to a screen? Am I, am I just looking at that green light uh, next to my webcam? What am I actually doing? That is one question that you might be asking or might have asked yourself. A um, couple of months ago. Am I doing it right? I mean, is there a formula that I can use? 
um, right? Um, are my students learning? That's another question that is very common. And I think this is part of a myth. Yesterday when um, Ana Isabel Campos, Dr. Ana Isabel Campos was talking about the myth that we might have in education and in distance education, uh, I was thinking about that particular myth, uh, myth for many years. And I remember uh, I, I committed this in as well. I used to think that the distance education was not that good. And then I started working at UNED in 2018 and I started noticing all the different things that we do to, uh, for quality assurance. And, and it's amazing to see all the process that is behind and, and everything that we have to do to be able to achieve students or to help students achieve their learning and construct their learning. But that might be one of the questions. Are my students learning? Or maybe they are not. Um, the next question that we might be asking is, how do I make it more appealing? Because maybe I'm talking too much and we have heard about this um, student talking time and PTT teacher talking time. And I might be saying, oh my God, like after today's class, I felt it was horrible class. I felt my students were not engaged enough. Now, you know what I have noticed is that sometimes we teachers are more pessimistic than we should be. Because I have found myself feeling that a class is not good enough. And then at the end of the class, I usually have a short evaluation or assessment of the class. I can do Mentimeter or it can be a, a Google form or Microsoft forms. And then just by asking two or three questions to my students, I realized that they enjoyed the class, that they learned a lot and that they want to have more activities like the ones we did that, that day. But we teachers tend to be very pessimistic. And uh, so we need to be careful about the answer to that question. Now, when it comes to the concepts that I told you about, this is the concept I want you to think of. Now, before 2020, I used to think of e-learning as one thing, online learning as another thing, online teaching as a different thing, distance education as a totally different thing. But then thanks to uh, one of my coworkers at Tech, Dr. Patricia Lopez, we started carrying out a research on uh, teachers at MEP and how they feel about distance education. And I started reading from Lorenzo Garcia Aretio. Um, he is one of the reference in uh, distance education. He used to work at UNED um, Spain. And he says that e-learning and online learning are no other than a format of distance education supported on digital technologies and ICT. So this is the concept I want you to think about when I mention online learning, or if I say distance education, I just want you to think about this particular um, definition. It's basically distance education, and we're using uh, technologies, we're using ICTs to help the process. So what we're doing right now today, it's part of distance education. We're using Zoom and we're using PowerPoint and we, we're using Mentimeter. We've been using so many different tools, but in the end, what we're doing is something at a distance. There is a, a physical separation between the teacher and the students or between the presenter and the participants in this case, all right? And uh, now I, I have a question here for you. So after looking at that definition and after everything we have been through, what aspects should a teacher consider when planning online interactions? So I want you to go into the chat, please. And I want you to type, what aspects should a teacher consider when planning online interactions? So when I'm thinking about my next online class, oh, on, mo on Monday, I have to teach. On Tuesday, I have to teach this group. So I hear students needs time, students interest, time. Um, oh, so many ideas, great. Uh, student situations, real time and effectiveness, likes and dislikes, age, objectives, easy instructions, objectives, internet connection, practices, students interest. Connectivity, rapport, motivation. Now, I want you to go ahead in the chat and just scroll up a little bit. Look at what everybody has been saying. And I want you to think about 
presence, face-to-face -face interaction, classroom interactions, would you consider those things that people are saying? Because in my case, I, I think it's exactly the same, except for connectivity. Uh, the only thing with connectivity is like, I would, I would think of connectivity in terms of, am I going to have an internet connection if I'm going to project a video or if I'm going to use something online in the classroom, um, in my school? But then I think the rest is quite the same. I need to think about my students' interest. I need to think about the objectives, about evaluation, about adding variety to my class, about interactions. Um, I need to think about uh, my students being able to learn and to build some learning motivation report. Now, what happens is that now we do it a little bit differently. Uh, the means is a different thing, okay? But I think we are all experts in education and that is something that we need to think about and we need to feel confident about. So I don't want you to start thinking just because I am a novice a distance education, I'm going to do a, a, a really bad job, like the worst job ever. No, you are a teacher. You know what it takes to communicate. You are a great teacher. So just think that the means are changing a little bit. And that's what we're going to be doing today, looking at some tips and tricks on how after thinking of those things that always happen in online and face-to-face -face interactions, how can I use that more effectively to avoid the problems you were mentioning before, okay? Now, there are seven requisites for, uh, for distance education or for distance, yeah, for distance education. And this was written by Homburg 1985. You might be saying, wow, that's too old. Let me tell you that that's not old at all. That's not old at all because I was born in 1985. So don't you dare saying that's old. Um, yes, it's not updated. It's not 20, uh, 2020, it's not 2015. But if, when you see these requisites, this is actually um, something that will call your attention, like how come Holmberg in 1985 was actually talking about this, which still is very valid. Number one, student-teacher motivational relationship. He said that there needs to be a two-way motivational relationship because I as a teacher motivate my student and my students with their reactions, with their work, they motivate me. So right now, for example, if I start being so boring and I start, um, I don't know, I don't know what I'm talking about, or I start uh, going all over the place with my talk, you might not be very motivated. But on the other side, if I don't see your reactions in the chat, if I don't see your participation in the Mentimeter, I am also going to start thinking, hmm, what's going on here? Maybe they are not motivated and I might, uh, my motivation might lower a little bit as well. So you see that there needs to be a reciprocal motivational relationship where the teacher encourages the student, but also the student ends up encouraging the teacher. Now, they don't necessarily know that they are doing so, but we teachers get motivation from our students. Now, there needs to be a friendship-like relationship. And by a friendship-like relationship, I always like to mention the phrase, uh, I, I think it was Brown who said, when you try to be a buddy, you become a nobody. So it's not that you're going to become best friends with your students or buddies, right? But we need to have a friendship-like relationship. Now think about friends. Friends support each other. Friends understand each other. Friends respect one another. So basically that's what Holmberg is it's talking about when he says friendship-like relationship. We need to be there for our students they need to feel supported, they need to feel uh, trusted, and they need to, to feel that they are capable of doing uh, what they are doing. Now, there needs to be self-regulation and self-instruction. As I told you, I have an entire talk and an entire workshop on self-regulation and self-instruction, uh, but basically self-regulation is knowing my strengths and weaknesses as a student, and self-instruction is understanding that my teacher is not going to be here 100% of the times. At UNED, for example, our students do a lot of self-instruction because they work on their own for, what is it, two, three weeks, 
They carry out many different activities. They post in social forums, they post in academic forums, they carry out research, they read, they answer questionnaires. And then after 15 days or 22 days, they have the contact with their teacher, like face-to-face -face or online uh, contact, let's say in a synchronous session. Now, a lot is done by self-instruction. At the same time, self-regulation, they need to regulate their time. They need to know what the best strategies for them are to learn, et cetera. Adequate feedback, it's really important. It's not just sending my student a worksheet saying, this is right, this is wrong. It's going a little beyond. And that's one of the requisites for distance education because since students are going to be self-instructed, we also need to provide a little bit more of help. So what I have done in the past sometimes is that I try to be even more specific with my feedback in online or in distance education interactions because my students are not going to have me there to ask questions immediately. Tech tools for permanent communication. Now, 1985, and this guy was talking about technological tools for personal communication or permanent communication. So you see that it's basically we're using technology to have communication with our students. We have the, the internal chat in the uh, learning management systems or internal email. We have emails, we have WhatsApp, we have, I don't know, Teams, a lot of different tools that will help us for communication because this is key in education, distance education. So I've been hearing some teachers in this study that I, tell, I told you about. And one of the things, one of, one of the concerns is like, I, I felt I needed to be there for my students, even though it was on a weekend, Saturday, Sunday, 10 p.m., 9 p.m., 6, 6 a.m. I needed to be there with my students. So that is normal, I would say, because students have that need. Like, I'm not going to see my teacher in 22 days. So it's, it's something immediate, right? What we need to find is the balance. And maybe, well, WhatsApp might not be the best at that moment, but we can use some other technological tools that will also allow us to have some space for ourselves, okay? And we're going to talk about that a little later, and I'm going to give you my own ideas, opinions, and experiences. Then dialogue, to get to meaningful learning. When we talk about dialogue, it's not only me talking to you and you talking to me, if the materials that I give you as a student, they need to be mediated and, and we call it a dialogue mediation. So I need to include all the steps that you're going to need to develop. What materials do you need? I need to be very specific because the student needs to feel every single step is clear when they are going on to the learning process. And of course, it needs to be a well-planned and organized process. Um, I have to admit that a couple of times I've heard teachers saying like, oh, you know, when I am in online education, like now at MEP, for example, I have presence and I have face-to-face -face with my students. Um, but then when I am, when I am with face-to-face -face, uh, on face-to-face -face interactions, then when I go online, I just connect and I just let my students see if they have some questions. That is not a well-planned and organized process. So even though we have a distance education, we need to be very well planned. And I learned this when I started working at UNED. I remember as a student, I used to get um, the, the academic guidelines or the, the, yeah, the academic guidelines or the syllabus for the courses, different names in different universities. I used to get them and they were six pages. And then I got my first course to plan at UNED and I ended up having a 32 page document. Why? Because every single activity needed to have all the steps by step process. And every single activity needed to have the objective, the, the general objective, the specific objectives, the rubrics, absolutely everything that the students needed. Because again, my students are not going to have me there with them to read the whole syllabus and to give explanations when they receive the syllabus. They register, they receive the syllabus, and immediately they start reading, okay? So if the syllabus is not clear enough, they're not going, they're going to start the course already demotivated and with a lot of questions 
that we could have answered in the syllabus, all right? Now, um, some um, teaching online, and, and this is my idea, teaching online doesn't have to be emotionally distant. And that's what I want you to think about. When we teach online, we don't, we don't want uh, to be distanced from our students emotionally. We are still human beings, and that's something that we should not forget about. Our students are struggling. Our students are facing the same problems. They are worried about COVID-19 in this particular case, but in other scenarios, they are also worried about complying with dates, and they are also worried about so many um, other things that because they, they have emotions. So even though we have physical distance, I truly believe that we should not have emotional distance with our students, okay? And here, what I want you to do is to scan this uh, QR code, and I'm going to paste in the chat, um, it's a Padlet. So you're going to go to the Padlet, and this Padlet is about engaging emotionally. So you go to the Padlet, you just click the plus button in the Padlet, and you start typing your answers to the main question. So I'm going to be in that Padlet in a moment. Give me just one second so I can go to the Padlet and I can share it with you. So here is the Padlet and you see that is, it, it already has a lot of ideas because teachers in the past and people in the past have been sharing with us a lot of different ideas here. So how do you engage your students emotionally while online? While you type, I'm going to take 30 seconds to uh, take a, just drink a sip of water and I'll be back with you. Please type your ideas of it. Mm -hmm. So now that we're talking about engaging emotionally, I see here that um, Marianela has a great question. She says, I think that during the online sessions, it's more difficult to communicate or know if the students are enjoying the lesson, especially when the video or microphones are off. We don't see the faces, reactions, smiles, et cetera. This means it is more difficult to create a relationship. How can we improve? Um, and I'm going to talk about my experience. I'm going to talk about my own ideas. I do two or three things that might help. One of the things is I always tell my students, um, I remind them of the importance of the camera. And I know it's not, um, it, it is not mandatory but I would really like to see your faces. I would really like to see who I am talking with. And believe me, some students will actually turn on their cameras because they don't care about having their cameras on. And you can actually do that. What I do when they don't turn the cameras at all, it's that I know this particular group, like I know, okay, today I have classes with this particular group and they never turn on their cameras. So I add a couple of activities during the session in which they have to turn on their camera. So I say like, okay, I want you to put your notebook close to the camera because you're going to show me your, your notes or you're going to show me your, your drawing. Once you have it there, please turn on the camera. And then what I do is that I'm actually trying to see that they are actually working. I'm assessing my students' work in that particular uh, part. What I also do is I do a lot of these things, like use the chat, type your answer in the chat. Don't give me the answer. Don't open your microphone. I want everybody, after I have everybody's answer in the chat, I am going to give you the real answer or the correct answer. And my students start participating a little bit more. I use uh, Padlet, I use Mentimeter, I use uh, a lot of different tools like uh, digital whiteboards, for example, so they can actually um, show me that they are learning. Uh, sometimes because they like the reactions in Microsoft Teams, for example, or here in Zoom. So I, I, tell, I tell them like, I want you, if you think this is correct, I want you to show me with a happy face. And so go ahead and, and add the reaction. So somehow I am having that connection with my students and I am showing them that their participation is important to me, right? Um, I also sometimes congratulate certain students who I see that they are paying attention and they're doing something that is really good. 
So I work with elementary school, uh, elementary students, elementary school students, most uh, of the times. And I noticed that when I start congratulating one person like, oh, um, I don't know, Tobias, that's a great picture that you drew over there. Thank you for sharing that with me, Tobias. I noticed that immediately more students start turning on their cameras because they want their teacher to recognize their work. And of course, I have to uh, spend some time doing that, okay? So I see here some ideas. Um, how has his or her day been? I share how I feel, especially if I am not uh, in an usual element. Uh, I tell them beforehand, interactive question, being creative. I make a parenthesis to encourage the student to find a solution for how they are feeling at the moment. So whenever you have or you run out of ideas, you're going to get this presentation today, you're going to get the links, you're going to get the uh, padlets, uh, the, the QR codes. So whenever you say like, I don't know what to do today, go ahead, go come to this padlet and look how many ideas you have here on how you can actually interact and engage emotionally with your students. Thank you very much for your valuable participation, your comments, and Marianela, such a great question. Thank you very much. Now, these are some of my ideas that I would really like to share with you. Number one, think about the early bird, how we usually call them. There are always going to be students who connect before time. And so what I usually do is I plan a short activity for students to do if they connect before the class. Just by having a PowerPoint showing and saying, we are going to start at 2 p.m. Some background music as they did today in this presentation and they have done during this seminar. That is a great idea. Why? Because people come into the classroom and if they don't see what happens when you are in the real classroom, like let's say in the school, you come into the classroom. And I always remember if we didn't see the teacher, we would say, Remember the 15 minute rule. If we don't see the teacher after 15 minutes, we leave. Exactly the same thing will happen online. If they come into the classroom, they open the session and they are the only ones in the session and they wait and wait and no teacher and no activity and just a black screen, they might start wondering, maybe I got into the wrong room. Uh, maybe the teacher is not going to teach today. So they just leave. So it's a great idea to think about them. Ask a question. I want you to pose. Today, we're going to be sharing, before we start the class, we're going to start sharing the name of our pets. Do you have a pet? So please type it in the chat while we wait for everybody to connect. And then I'm having some interaction with my students. They see that something is going on. Uh, at, at the same time, they start feeling like, oh, we are in class. We are about to start just by having some background music. And when they enter, you start greeting them. Uh, hello, um, Tobias. Hello, Juan Pablo. Um, Marianela, welcome to today's class. Um, hello, everybody. We're going to start in five minutes. We're waiting for everybody to connect. Thank you very much for being on time. That is something students value and they feel acknowledged. And of course, that engages emotionally. Ask genuine questions. If you ask your students, I want to know how you're feeling today. And it's just a filler. You just want your, your students to answer and you don't care about their answers. Please don't ask the question. If you're not going to acknowledge the answer. The other day I asked the question, um, how are you feeling today? How have you been doing this week? And then one particular student uh, just told me like, teacher, uh, you know, this week my grandma died. I immediately got shocked and, and I said like, okay, what should I say now? Uh, because it's, it's quite a hard answer to hear. And so by acknowledging the student, like, I'm sorry to hear that, my sincere condolences, how are you feeling? Are you feeling a little better? Um, you know, things uh, that those things happen and, and maybe I'm not feeling how you're feeling right now, but if you need somebody to hear you, go ahead. If you don't feel well today, don't worry, if you have to leave the class at some point, don't worry about that. But make sure you are asking questions that you actually want to hear the answer, okay? Warm up, it's always good to have a warm up. Even when we are online, many times we'll forget about the warm up part and we just start teaching. 
and we just like straight forward. We go like open your book to page number 20. We're going to review the grammar that we uh, studied last class. And students are shocked at that point. So a warm up. I usually like what we call community builders as warm up activities. And community builders are basically these kind of activities in which we start knowing people by the person they are, not by a number, not just a classmate. So activities like, uh, I don't know, write a number that is meaningful to you in your life. And then we're going to try to guess what that number means in your life. Or three, uh, two truths and one lie. That's one that I like a lot. Or tell me three things that might surprise everybody else about yourself. Um, so you start knowing your students. That is one thing. You start realizing what their interests, uh, their interests are. And then uh, your students also start knowing each other. Um, the next idea, it's the touch point. And we can call it an individual touch point. Even though we are here in, in the whole class, we're all connected at the same time. There needs to be a place where students feel comfortable to reaching out to the teacher. Um, it can be email, it can be a Padlet, it can be a Google form, many different ways of doing it. But make sure your students know how to talk to you during the week or how to reach out to you when they have a question. Teacher, you know, I was doing um, the Guía de Trabajo Autónomo, the Autonomous or Self-Study Guide this week. And part number three, I don't understand. Can you please help me? Now, if you say the touch point is going to be the email, make sure you check that email frequently because your students uh, might not have three weeks uh, before you answer, okay? So, for example, as a rule of thumb, at the university, we try to reach out to students uh, in 24 or 48 hours after the question has been posted. That is a, a good timing, right? And also be clear about the touch point with your students. If the class is today, I am not going to be able to answer your questions today. You need to answer your question, you to ask questions before today, okay? Before the day of the class, at least 24 hours before, because that means you have been doing your work, okay? Um, look at the camera. If you have been noticing what I'm doing, I'm trying to, for you to feel I'm talking to you. So there are many tricks uh, that we can actually do. I remember the first times, I mean, it was so hard for me to look at the camera, but then I realized I just need to think there's somebody over there. And I, in my computer, I see a green light. I know in some of your computers, you see red lights, blue lights, and just looking at that and imagining a person's face. What I can also do is uh, here in Zoom, for example, I have uh, the, the picture of one of the participants here. What I do is that I put it right below the camera. And by looking at that picture, and right now, for example, the picture I see is Tobias Brizuela. So I can imagine I'm talking to Tobias Brizuela and you are actually thinking I'm looking at you because you, you get that feeling. Uh, eye contact is important no matter uh, where you are. I had this amazing experience last year of working for Aprendo en Casa TV. Um, and one of the requisites, one of the things we needed to actually think about and do all the times was look into the camera because they would always tell us like people at home, they're watching TV and they want to feel that you are talking to them. If you see journalists, if you see the best speakers, when they talk online, they are always looking at you, okay? Um, and background and noise. If you don't have a good background to show, go ahead and create your virtual background so people don't get distracted. It can just be a white screen, that's it. And that will not distract our students. The noise that you have on the background, every time I am going to have a session like this one, everybody in my house knows I have a session. And I tell them, if you see the, the door of my room is uh, locked, please don't knock because I am not able to answer. Please keep the volume of the television low. So they know that I, they are going to be able to do whatever they want once I open that door. 
And that is something you tell your family and they will understand. Of course, there are things I cannot control. I cannot control my dogs, for example. And you might hear them sometimes barking around. Um, that's something I cannot control or a car that goes on the street. But as much as possible, focus and, and control your background and your nose, noise. Now, this is the continuation. Some other ideas that I have for you. Routines help students feel at ease. My students already know that when they enter the classroom, they are going to see a screen. They are going to see the PowerPoint for the day. And there is the date. There is a welcoming phrase. There is the topic. And there are three symbols, one with a camera, one with a microphone, and one with a hand. Always the same, uh, the, the same icons. And they know the microphone is keep your microphones off unless you are addressing the group. The second one or the, the one about the hand is raise your virtual hand whenever you want to share. And the camera, it's that I'm going to tell them it's optional, but remember, I really like to see who I am talking to, to feel that we are in the classroom. And just by doing that, students learn the, the etiquette. Um, there was one of the concerns in the, in the Mentimeter earlier. So the etiquette, it's something really uh, important, but students learn that. Be yourself. Don't act as a robot. We don't have to act totally differently because we are online. No, we can just be ourselves. Greet your students, tell your students, listen to them, ask questions, have certain jokes, and, and laugh about yourself. Um, provide equal opportunities to your students, okay? So, if I am going to be calling names, I need to make sure I'm providing equal opportunities to all students. And that is another way in which I can have my students engaged with the lesson. Because if I spend 20 minutes without asking a question, they might be drinking coffee or they go to the restroom or they talk to their parents or they're watching uh, Netflix on television. But if, you're, if they know you're going to be asking questions very often, they're going to be active. And then you say, Margot, can you please tell me one uh, of these things. Tobias, can you please help me out here? Um, Jorge, can you please do this or that for me? Can you read this phrase for me? So they are going to be active during the class. And students value honesty. And this has to do with, or this is related to be yourself. You know, today we're going to try a new tool. This is the first time I tried it with students. I tried it in my phone. I tried it in the pod, in the iPad, or I tried it from two different computers, but I don't know if that is going to work pretty well. Please be patient. Students value that, okay? Um, if I, the other day I was having problems because my students were not listening to uh, my computer sound. And so I just told them like, you know what? I'm going to do one, one more thing. Sorry about this. I'm going to go out of the, of the class. I'm going to come in again and let's see if that works, okay? Please wait for me here. And I just got disconnected. And, I don't have to lie. I don't have to tell them I'm having internet connections and in my cable company, it's a, a piece of trash. No, I can be honest. I can be myself and I can tell my students, well, we teachers also struggle here. You're not the only one struggling, okay? Now, when it comes to making decisions, synchronous and asynchronous. In synchronous learning, we need to make sure that we understand that learning happens at the same time. Everybody's connected. We're having the things at the same time. Um, Real-time interactions between teacher and students and also between peers. And structure is required. Keep it simple. And I really liked, uh, I think it was, uh, yeah, it was Professor Davis um, Huffin who said, Kiss, keep it simple, stupid. So yes, keep it simple. You don't have to do all this display of technological tools to have a great lesson. Some of my greatest lessons this year have been just me, the camera, and some pieces of paper, okay? Um, then asynchronous. Flip learning allows for classroom time to deepen understanding and discussion. So basically students do something at home and when they come to class, they already did something. They have started building their um, ideas and their learning. And use the learning management system or LMS efficiently and effectively. Uh, make sure that if you're going to post an activity for your students to do, 
do it with instructions, very detailed instructions. If you have seen those, um, those books that are very famous, like uh, Computing for Dummies and Instructions for Dummies. So do it like that. Very detailed instructions. Step number one, go to this website. Step number two, click here. Step number three, open this document. Step number four, because students are going to be coming back and forth from the learning management system, okay? Or the platform you're using. Use it efficiently, but use it, use it effectively as well. Now we need to prioritize, and this has to do with decision-making. So um, if we have challenge that is really high and we have low scaffolding, this is going to happen. Uh, look at that picture. My student is going to get really frustrated. So if I give my students, for example, in the um, self-study guides, Guia de Trabajo Autónomo Admet, if I give my students a challenge that is really high and I, I'm not there for them, it's going to, pro uh, to provoke some frustration. So I need to make sure that the challenge is according to the scaffolding. If I have high challenge, I have high scaffolding. Now think about this when you do synchronous or asynchronous. A reading, for example. What are we reading for? Are we doing reading comprehension? So students are going to read, and after they read, they are going to um, they are going to read and they're going to answer some questions. Do they really need a whole class for that, or can they do it by them by their own? Maybe doing it by their own will increase a little bit the challenge, and they are not going to get bored because if we are in class reading with the help of the teacher, maybe it's low challenge, low scaffolding, boredom zone. So we always want to be in the zone of proximal development. And that is the key there. Think about the activity. If I do this activity in the face-to-face -face interaction online, is it going to be, do students really need my scaffolding to be able to do that activity? If they don't need it that much, I can do it asynchronous. Let's keep the uh, synchronous session for the high challenge, high scaffolding where I am there, I'm able to help my students, okay? And now the fun part, the tools. I prepared three tools and I know again, uh, Cindy uh, talked a lot about different tools and the uh, uh, toolkit at UNED. Also Debbie talked about so many different tools that I was so um, glad to see there. I was so excited and I was taking a lot of screenshots and going and looking for them. Uh, I thank them very much for that. Um, so some of the tools, we're going to start looking at Bamboozle. So Bamboozle, it's basically uh, create your own games. This, this platform, you can create your own games. You can play them live in live sessions, face-to-face -face, uh, online interactions. Assign your students to study or play. So this can be worked synchronously, playing the game, or asynchronously. I give my students the code. They can study and they can play on their own. I can create a folder, just one in the in the free version, only just uh, only one folder, and I can like other games and play them easily. So I'm going to try to go to the bamboozle here. Give me just one moment because I have the bamboozle, and I'm going to share with you the bamboozle. Let me make sure that I'm sharing my sound as well. Um, okay, so it's this one. Okay. So you see, this is basically the bamboozle. You create your, um, your cards. These are like cards that you create. And it's the uh, two clues, one animal. This is, this is one I didn't create it. You see that I have it with the like. So basically I go to my library, likes, and I'm going to find all the games that I really like, okay? So in this case, it's this one with the owl over there. Um, then if I give my students the website, the URL right here on top, so it's the one that Ariel just copied. You can do it on your own. Uh, like at home, you can actually study or you can play. Live show is just for pro version. I haven't paid and I, I don't think I'm going to pay. Um, then we click on play, for example. If it is right now here, we're going to play just as one team very quickly. And we can choose some options. You see that many of them are for plus. Uh, we can have a timer, for example, a pause uh, button. Colorful grid, that one I really like. Then power apps, uh, I always keep it like that. The themes, I don't touch anything and I play classic. So what I do is I get something similar to um, 
This is something similar to Jeopardy. Now, in the chat, if we were in Teams, I would be asking you to open your microphones and do that. But because of time, in the chat, I want somebody to type one number from 1 to 16. The first number that you type is the one that I'm going to uh, uncover. And then there is going to be one question, 11. Oh, 11 two times. I'm going to play that one. You see, you win 50 points. That's a power up, OK? Very good. And you hear the music. Another number, number one. OK, very good. I have large teeth. I am an ocean predator. Type the answer in the chat, please. What animal is it? I have large teeth. I'm an ocean predator. Ah, let's check if it's the shark. Yes, it's the shark. So you see that I have two options. If I click, oops, you lose points. If I say, okay, you win points. And you see now you have 75 points. The last one is going to be number seven. I'm huge. I live in the Z. I'm huge. I live in the sea. The whale. Hmm. Yes, it's a whale. You see, you get different points. So students can do it again asynchronously, or they can do it synchronously, as we did here in this example. Bamboozle.com, very intuitive, simple to use, and students love it. The other one I use, and this was mentioned uh, in the in one of the previous sessions, the wheel of names. You can sign up with your Google account totally for free. Uh, save the wheels for later. Spin and remove and enjoy. Very simple to use as well. So let me just make sure I have it open here. The wheel of names. Um, the only thing that I don't really like is that it has some advertising. But anyways, um, so here is the wheel of names. And you see that you can use names if you want, or you can use different topics, different questions. When you have, uh, when you're uh, already uh, logged in with your Google account, you can create a new one. You can open. So you see, if I open, I'm going to get my um, my wheels here. So I have different wheels here, and I can open them. So this one is favorites. I can just open it, and it's there. So I can save it, I can share it with other people. So if my students are working in breakout rooms, I can share the link and they can play, okay? So here, let's see what they are going to be getting. Uh, it's favorite. So I want you to type in the chat, your favorite place, favorite place, okay? And you can see that I can remove, and now place is not in the wheel anymore. Okay, I see home, mountain, home, very good. The next one, your favorite, favorite animal. Okay, type your favorite animal. Dog, cat, wolf, cat, horse, rabbit. Very good. So you see, you can actually use these with your students. You can, what I like about these tools is that you can use them yourself or you can give the link to the students and they're going to work uh, in breakout rooms or they can work at home to practice, etc. Now the next one, it's going to be for you to do um, together. I'm not going to post the, the link yet because it's up to 40, uh, 32 students. So unfortunately not everybody's going to be able to participate, but you're going to do this um, uh, in breakout rooms. So at least one person in the breakout room can open the, the notebook cast. And it's, a, it's just a, a whiteboard, let's say. So let me open it for you to see, and then I'm going to give you the link and tell you what you have to do, okay? So this is the tool. Again, you can create an account. It's totally for free. Um, you see that I have already added the, the thing to my screen here. And what I can do is, give me just one moment because I don't know, okay. So here, what I can do is I can add text and sticky notes. I can change colors. I can have the chat. So I can chat with the participants, okay? Um, I can invite to the board. So by that, I'm going to paste this. And after I copy this link for you, you're going to go into breakout rooms. And what I want you to do in your breakout rooms is very quickly, we're going to have just five minutes in the breakout rooms. And you will open this thing here. And you're going to share some tools that you use to shorten the distance, okay? So let me just make sure in the chat, we have the link, okay? And uh, the uh, organizing committee, I think Ariel, you can open the breakout rooms, please. So everybody, 
five minutes to do this work. So now what you're seeing on my screen, um, it's basically what I see as a, as a teacher, right? I see the list of names here uh, to the right and I see all the people. I can uh, open and close the chat. So for example, if I click here on the chat, I can see the chat and I can chat with everybody. I can uh, add recommendations. Also, I can move things around. So this is what I like, uh, what I call the a great mess. And a great mess for a teacher is something that seems to be a mess, but it's working somehow, right? So that is um, something that I, I really like about this tool. And uh, again, I can, for example, if I close the whiteboard, let me just uh, make sure that I want to exit the whiteboard, okay? So you see, this is my teacher panel. And I have UNED, that is the title that I gave to my whiteboard. And when I open it again, okay, so it's going to be there. Everything is going to be there. If I want, I can clean the whiteboard. Um, I don't remember exactly where it was. I think it is here, board settings. I can clear the board, clear images, clear the chat, okay? So as a teacher, I can do that. Um, or I can just go back and I can create a new board or next time I can give the students the link and I can say, okay, let's check what we did last class. Remember you were doing these, uh, working on these ideas, okay? So that is, and what I like about this one is that it's, it's for free, okay? It's very simple, easy to use for teachers and students as well, all right? So um, I think we're about to finish. So here is my contact information. And it's time for the Q&A. Thank you very much because you have been such a great audience. Thank you, thank you very much. It's almost six o'clock and you're so engaged and participating. So I really appreciate that. We want to thank Master Jonathan Elizondo for his wonderful collaboration in this seminar. Thank you, Jona. Now we give the word to Master Margot Ale Fonseca will share some of maybe comments or questions, but I think you you have already covered everything, but let's see if Margot had something to share. Go ahead, Margot. No, basically people are just uh, claiming that this was an outstanding presentation and they are really thankful, Jonah, for all the time you spent uh, planning your, your presentation and all the resources that you shared with us today. Thank you. It, it's my honor. Um, let me tell you that I feel really honored. And I also want to congratulate the, the organizing committee because this has been an amazing uh, seminar and the website, wow, outstanding. So all the work you have done, thank you 